Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the High Energy um, Lunch Seminar on Wednesdays in the era where we must be remote. Uh, today, we have an unusual configuration for this seminar and that both of our slots will be filled by one speaker, Paul Ricker, who obtained his PhD at the University of Chicago, working with Don Lamb on simulations of galaxy cluster mergers. After a postdoc with Craig Sarazen at Virginia, he returned to Chicago to join the ASCII Flash Center, where he contributed to the development of the Flash simulation simulation code. Since 2002, he has been a professor in astronomy at the University of Illinois. He works primarily on hydrodynam hydrodynamical simulation problems in the area of galaxy clusters and binary stars. And uh, so, take it away. Okay, thank you. Um, let me share my screen here. Uh, look on next machine. Okay. And um, are you able to see the, uh, the, the screen view and not the presenter view? Yes, it looks fine. Great, thank you. Um, okay, uh, so uh, thanks again for inviting me. And, um, uh, and um, uh, today I'll be talking about uh, uh, modeling AGN accretion and feedback and uh, galaxy cluster simulations. Uh, this is work with uh, Celeste Liu, who is a, a student of mine up until last year. Um, who, she finished her PhD, and she's now working with the SKA group at uh, Cambridge University. Um, uh, the uh, work is actually an outgrowth of her uh, thesis work, so um, I apologize. The finished results will be a little bit light in this uh, in this talk, but uh, because it's uh, it's still under development, but um, hopefully you'll get a, a good sense of uh, where things will be going. Okay, um, let's see. So uh, just to get uh, people start off on the same page, uh, this is about galaxy clusters. And of course, galaxy clusters, unfortunately, is a bad name for these objects. Um, they are mostly not galaxy uh, clusters. They're mostly dark matter and uh, hot gas. And that hot gas, the intracluster medium, um, is uh, at temperatures 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8 degrees that uh, cause it to emit um, X-rays, and um, and that is the subject of this talk. Um, so the clusters come in a, a few different varieties. Uh, morphologically, <clears throat> we have uh, train wrecks where uh, uh, clusters are merging with objects of similar mass. Um, they, of course, uh, grow through uh, accretion of individual galaxies and groups as well. Um, but um, the, uh, the particular kinds of clusters that uh, we'll be focusing on are the more relaxed ones uh, known as cool core clusters, like Abel 1795. Um, so, there we go. Okay, so uh, it's been known for a while now that um, uh, you, know, you, can, uh, you can take X-ray observations and use them to infer the density and temperature uh, profiles of clusters, uh, particularly the relaxed ones, and get uh, an estimate of the, um, the entropy of the gas. And uh, it's been known... Yes. There, there seems to be something wrong with your screen where uh, at least I'm seeing it's kind of zoomed in. Is anyone else seeing that? So you're not seeing the, the main view? The... I'm seeing the main view. Okay, maybe hmm. it's just me. Hmm, okay. Um, it seems fine to me as well. All right. Fine for me. <laughs> okay, um, so you don't see the two little, they like the next slide and the current slide. No, it's, it's fine, don't worry. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks. Um, so, uh, so uh, it's been known for a little while that um, that uh, these uh, these entropy profiles of clusters are come in sort of two flavors. It's, it's a bimodal distribution. Um, there are uh, clusters, uh, particularly the ones that are um, more uh, of the train wreck variety, that that have an entropy floor, and uh, and then there are core, uh, clusters with a, a low entropy uh, center. These so-called cool core clusters, and uh, lower entropy, of course, means a um, a shorter cool cooling time. Um, and, uh, and so these, uh, these clusters um, can cool by uh, radiation um, within less than a Hubble time. Um, and so you would expect that they should be forming uh, stars copiously at rates of maybe even a thousand uh, solar masses a year. Um, by and large, they are not doing that with some notable exceptions that um, prove the rule, such as the uh, Phoenix cluster um, shown here on the right. Um, and the Phoenix cluster, um, as you can see, the um, uh, the cooling time profile uh, is much below the typical range of the um, of these school core clusters. Nevertheless, this um, this low central entropy is a defining feature of these clusters. So the the cool core problem is why isn't this gas um, 
you know, forming stars at the expected rate. Um, uh, with uh, with the advent of Chandra and XMM, it became possible to um, to do spectroscopy in the very centers of these clusters and to show uh, definitively that these um, uh, you know in these clusters the the gas there is cooling gas, but not nearly as much as you would expect from a, a standard what's called a cooling flow model in which the um, gas is losing pressure support and therefore slumping inward. Um, the emission lines that you would expect from the uh, the very cold gas. Cold, very cold, of course, meaning less than a tenth of a keV or or even less than that, um, are are simply not present, and um, and yet that doesn't mean that star formation is not occurring. It's just occurring uh, in a very suppressed way. Uh, most uh, clusters, if we look on the right hand side here, um, have uh, you know if you if you plot uh, the star formation rate against the um, the mass dropout rate from the uh, intercluster medium, you find that it, it corresponds to you know, a, a star formation rate of maybe 1% of the expected value um, with uh, the exceptions like the Phoenix cluster, for example, being up here in, a, um, uh, in a, you know, more of a 50% or so range. All right, so uh, so what's uh, this means that there has to be some kind of a heating source, and because the um, the the ratio of the star formation rate to the um, the mass dropout rate is um, you, you know is so constant over a large uh, dynamic range, um, this heating source has to be tuned um, to uh, to avoid sort of puffing up too much and uh, allowing cooling too much, um, and uh, and. Attention is generally focused on uh, the role of um, active galaxies uh, at the centers of these clusters. So the, the brightest cluster galaxies, very mo massive ellipticals that are found in these galaxies or in these clusters, um, uh, have uh, active galaxy, active galactic nuclei, supermassive black holes, typically of uh, ten to the nine solar masses or so, that um, that are actively producing uh, feedback that appears to be heating the surroundings. Um, so here's an, a, an example. There are many uh, such examples now um, from Chandra and uh, uh, and uh, VLA that uh, that show um, that in these systems there are cavities or openings in the um, x-ray uh, emission. So the intercluster medium has been displaced um, and nicely filling those cavities or, or sitting within those cavities is uh, radio emitting, synchrotron emitting, um, plasma usually uh, referred to as cosmic rays, the high energy electrons that are produced um, in uh, AGN outflows. And, um, and that seems to be filling those, those cavities. So, um, so the strong sort of morphological correspondence between the X-ray and radio that strongly suggests that the um, AGN are doing something to the intercluster medium. Um, and uh, and this, is, uh, this correspondence is, is um, heightened when you compare the radio power of these, um, of these sources against the central entropy. And we see that there's a, 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 a sort of a threshold or transition uh, central entropy below which um, there's a lot of uh, radio power being produced by these, um, these sources and above which generally um, they're much quieter. So, um, so uh, strong indication that in these cool core clusters where we expect the cooling to be occurring, the um, AGN are all at the same time producing heat. Moreover, the amount of, of heat that they produce um, is sufficient to offset the cooling and is tuned uh, as we need. Um, so uh, here at the bottom is um, uh, the uh, the power needed um, over a, uh, a typically a bubble rise time to um, to inflate these cavities um, based on just mechanical work and um, its comparison against the uh, the, the uh, rate of cooling uh, due to X-ray emission and you see that it, it scales pretty well. There's a lot of scatter um, corresponding to um, you know, different a range of different values uh, in the efficiency of that um, jet or that uh, cavity inflation. So, um, so there are a lot of questions about this. Um, how does the coupling occur? How does the um, how does this feedback cycle work? Um, but to start uh, to understand that, we need to know what kind of um, AGN they are, they, they, these are, because there are a variety of different types. Um, it's been known again for about a decade or so that at, at least actually that um, that there uh, uh, there's a bimodal distribution of um, of uh, types of feedback from AGN. Uh, broadly speaking these are separated into what are called the mechanical or radio mode feedback and the radiator uh, or quasar mode feedback. 
um, the mechanical or radio mode feedback um, is uh, corresponds to a, a low, relatively low accretion rate compared to the Eddington rate. Um, the feedback comes comes out in the form of uh, mostly gas kinetic energy, and um, and the radio structure of these sources typically is center brightened, so like a Fanarov Rayleigh type one. Uh, structure, and um, that's to be opposed uh, against the uh, the quasar mode feedback uh, at a high accretion rate relative to Eddington. Um, most of the um, e energy that comes out is in the form of radiation and uh, an edge brightened uh, FR two type structure. So it's the um, it's the FR one or the uh, radio mode uh, sources that are typically seen in uh, the centers of clusters of galaxies, and so those are the ones that we're most concerned with uh, for the purposes of uh, galaxy cluster feedback. Although it should be noted that in galaxy evolution, the, uh, the radiative mode also plays a role um, in lower mass systems. Um, so this, uh, this gas, uh, as I said, is, uh, is cooling not at the expected rates and certainly not in a distributed uniform fashion. Um, however, it is cooling and um, despite the, the heating from these, these uh, AGN jets. And uh, we know this because um, uh, there are many examples now uh, of what's shown in this really spectacular um, Perseus-A uh, image, um, the, set, the uh, BCG at the center of the Perseus cluster, um, shows um, uh, a variety of uh, multi-kiloparsec long um, H-alpha emitting filaments that have been ionized um, by the surroundings, but uh, of course, to be, be ionized, they have to have cooled to um, to be for, to form neutral hydrogen, and um, and if you compare the lengths of these uh, these very thin filaments with the um, the expected uh, deposition rate of cool gas as a function of distance from the cluster center, um, you find that their lengths. Uh, these these symbols here indicate the lengths, uh, typical lengths of the um, uh, the filaments in these clusters correspond to uh, the points in the cluster where um, thermal instability starts uh, stops um, uh, rising, stops uh, increasing the deposition rate. So um, there's a there's a, again a clear sort of uh, correspondence between the the sizes of these filaments and the um, the region within the center of a cluster in which you expect thermal instability to um, uh, produce co a condensed gas. And uh, moreover, um, in, in the millimeter, if we look at uh, molecular gas, um, there's there's also molecular gas there that um, that is is also filamentary, and moreover uh, shows um, the signs of interaction with the um, the uh, radio uh, radio filled bubbles, uh, X-ray cavities. Um, so, for example, in this system, this is well, this is a Perseus cluster uh, with with Alma, and uh, and you can see that the um, the the molecular filaments appear to be uh, draped around the um, the X-ray cavity, and uh, if you uh, figure out the amount of mass of cold gas that's um, that's producing this emission, um, it's uh, it's too much to be ex to expect that the, um, the 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 jets actually accelerated cold clouds from um, the center of the uh, of the cluster. Um, cold clouds are denser; that you know it's it's hard to efficiently accelerate them. Um, instead, it's more likely that this um, this gas is actually cooled in situ, um, perhaps because of gas that's been entrained in the wake of the um, of the bubbles. Okay, uh, and uh, and this has led to, uh, together with uh, some theoretical developments, this led to a picture in which um, the uh, the gas at the centers of these clusters is uh, is multi phase and consists of cold clouds embedded in hot. In a diffuse hot medium, and um, and this uh, this is based on the discovery that um, the ratio of the thermal instability to the free fall time uh, controls the accretion rate onto AGN in um, in simulations. Uh, this was discovered uh, uh, about nine years ago. Um, a number of uh, papers came out from um, uh, Elliot Quadiert's group at Berkeley, um, then at Berkeley, and um, and uh, Massimo Gaspari. And um, this is an example of, there are a few simulations here, but let's focus on the C10 simulation. This is showing um, the ratio of, the smallest ratio of uh, thermal instability to free fall time as a function of time. And if we focus on the black curve here, this particular simulation, you see that at below 10, um, it, it stays below 10 for a while, then jumps up and, and, and stays at a steady state value above 10. And that jump corresponds to a time 
uh, when the um, the mass accretion rate of cold gas lower than um, I think it's 0.01 keV has um, you know goes through a dramatic increase. So this very short period of time when cold gas is being accreted drives this transition upward. Um, and then after that, it's stable again. So there's kind of there are kind of two states that one can be in. One in which um, in which cold gas, cold clouds are are falling onto the uh, uh, onto the core, and um, and then the uh, the high state where uh, um, only you know if there's any accretion at all, it's happening mostly through the the hot mode. So this chaotic cold accretion picture. Um, is a fundamental part of the um, the feedback loop now. The idea is that um, thermal instability drives accretion, the accretion produces feedback, and then the feedback um, comes out in the form of jets that, as they slow down uh, through interaction with the ICM, um, be form these, these nearly spherical bubbles, and these bubbles rise buoyantly um, in training gas from the ICM that um, be, it cools through um, expansion and, and cooling, radiative cooling, and becomes thermally unstable. So what this means, though, is that <clears throat> even though you have this system, this supermassive black hole, which um, you know has a Schwarzschild radius that's on the order of a milliparsec, uh, it's producing a feedback mechanism that uh, regulates the thermodynamic state of the gas on kiloparsecs and tens of kiloparsec scales. So that's a dramatic range of um, of scales and uh, and very difficult to uh, incorporate into cluster galaxy cluster simulations, especially. Uh, for uh, simulations in which you're trying to have a cosmological sample of clusters. Um, so, uh, so how can we deal with this in simulations? Uh, well, one question you might ask is why don't we just try to refine the heck out of it? Um, there are a number of techniques now for, um, for achieving uh, enhanced resolution in gas dynamic simulations uh, in just uh, selected parts of a volume ranging from adaptive mesh refinement to uh, moving mesh, mesh techniques um, and um, uh, as, as well as of course smooth particle hydrodynamics with uh, varying uh, kernel size and um, and uh, these Lagrangian techniques if you push them uh, on um, on re-simulations of individual galaxies for example you can indeed start to get to the level where um, you're reaching the edge of the accretion disk this is an example from Anglais Alcazar, Alcazar. Um, uh, recently that um, shows uh, uh, cosmological re-simulation of a single galaxy uh, with um, uh, enhanced refinement in the location of the uh, black hole uh, reaching down to scales that are um, on the milliparsec to one-tenth of a milliparsec level. So, so it's starting to get to the point where it can actually see the, um, see the outside of the accretion disk. Um, so that would resolve the um, the gas flows in the vicinity, and that would, of course, um, uh, co uh, collect the uh, both the hot and the cold phases uh, naturally through direct simulation. Um, the problem, of course, is that um, the field of accretion accretion disk simulation is is one in which um, you need uh, general relativistic magneto uh, hydrodynamics with uh, with radiation, and in some in some uh, cases, two temperature. Uh, modeling that requires high resolution in and of itself. So I don't think it's even with um, hyper refinement, it's realistic to expect that anytime soon, um, cosmological or cluster simulations will will also be able to um, simultaneously evolve the uh, the accretion disk. So some kind of a subgrid model is needed, um, but it's clear though that um, you know we're finally getting to the place where uh, with galaxy and um, and group simulations. Uh, we're, we're able to um, directly resolve certainly the Bondi uh, radius of these of these black holes and um, to be able to see, um, you know, the relevant gas dynamics in their vicinity, even if we can't handle the accretion disk directly. <clears throat> so uh, sub resolutions, uh, sub resolution or sub grid models are, are needed. Um, yeah, as I said, and um, and uh, these have been included in cosmological simulations for some time. Um, the earliest ones were uh, in the early 2000s, uh, um, and um, and mostly considered uh, hot mode accretion, accretion directly from the hot intercluster medium. Um, they uh, they had resolutions that were typically on the kiloparsec scale, and so uh, there's no way to uh, resolve. Uh, certainly down to the accretion disk or even within the Bondi radius. So what they would do is to um, is to compute <coughs> a uh, 
some kind of a smooth density and sound speed, uh, typically on the scale of the softening length of SVH particles or um, the grid um, zone spacing of uh, mesh codes, and then uh, compute a Bondi um, accretion rate based on the Bondi formula here, or Bondi Hoyle Littleton, um, if we're using the velocity as well, and, um, and then scale it up by some factor to try to match observations. This uh, scale factor alpha is typically on the order of 10 to 100. Um, but, um, and, and the sort of um, justification offered for this is that, well, if this, uh, you know, if we could resolve this better, um, the density would typically be higher and the gas would be cooler. So, um, so that would boost the actual Bondi Hoyle accretion rate. But of course, this assumes that the gas flow inflow is dominated, the accretion is dominated by the hot phase, and also that it's um, a spherically symmetric uh, uh, flow. So <clears throat> there are a number of built-in assumptions to this model that are are um, uh, difficult to justify given our picture uh, that we have observationally now. Um, this has been recognized for a while and a um, and number of authors have uh, tried various forms of cold mode accretion. So for example, Young and Reynolds um, using, using, I believe they use flash actually, uh, so they use tracer particles to uh, um, capture uh, cold gas dropping out of the ICM and then followed uh, those tracer particles as they move around being buffeted by the, or move following uh, streamlines um, until they pass through a capture radius. And if they did that, then over a free fall time, they would be, um, they would have mass taken away from them and added to the black hole. Um, this again, this, this scale radius or this cooling radius, sorry, this capture radius is typically about a kiloparsec. Um, there are other ways of doing this. There are countless variations on both of these uh, hot and cold mode accretion models. Um, one uh, to note um, that's used in, um, I believe is used in the 300 simulations is uh, um, to have uh, different alpha values to, um, to uh, scale the um, Bondi rate, but to separately keep track of um, passage of hot and cold gas passing through this, um, this, uh, this capture radius and then apply different scaling factors to them. Um, and uh, one thing to note here also is that a, another variation that considers the fact that uh, gas falling in uh, will, will not immediately accrete specifically depending on its, um, its angular momentum with respect to the black hole um, is, uh, is a method by Power et al in 2011 that, um, that has, uh, doesn't try to model the accretion disk but, um, but has a sort of a delay time scale that depends on the um, the angular momentum of the particles moving through this volume. Let's see. And these parameters uh, are kind of arbitrary, but, um, but uh, some of them, they can be um, uh, um, uh, constrained by observations. Um, and uh, uh, Karen Young was uh, uh, a student of mine uh, back in 2012, and she um, did a, a, a comprehensive study of a number of these parameters and their effect on uh, galaxy cluster observables and found that some of them, um, like the uh, the secretion factor alpha, um, the efficiency of um, heating, the mechanical heating that comes out of um, out of the uh, AGN, and the size of the volume within which you um, you deposit this heat, all have an effect on gas mass and luminosity that can be used to place good constraints on those parameters. But um, but other parameters that come into the model um, are are not you know it's not as sensitive to the those and. Um, and there are some, uh, there's some things like the sunyai zeldovich effect, which um, offer uh, poor constraints. So, um, and even in the cases where we can, we can sort of constrain these parameters, there, there's still the concerns about the, um, the physical realism of the, uh, the subgrid model. So, uh, so what do we know about accretion disks? Well, uh, quite a bit more than we, uh, than we used to. Um, we know from analytical modeling and from GRMHD simulations that um, accretion disk structure doesn't just depend on uh, the accretion rate. Now, remember that the um, radio, the distinction between radio and quasar mode feedback was largely because of the um, um, the accretion rate. And, and in these uh, subgrid models, often there'll be a switch between uh, radio and um, and uh, and quasar mode feedback that is triggered around a tenth of the Eddington accretion rate. But we know that the accretion disk structure doesn't just depend on the accretion rate. In fact, you can draw this sort of uh, phase diagram of um, different equilibrium models where um, we have accretion rate as a fraction of Eddington on the left-hand side. And on the bottom, we have um, the multiple of, this is a different alpha, this is the viscosity parameter in the accretion disk times the 
height integrated um, mass density, surface mass density. And um, we see that uh, on the right hand side, we have the, um, the classical Shakura Sinai of thin disk uh, solution. Um, is thermally stable, it passes, it is connected through a thermally unstable branch to um, the so called slim disk models. These are all geometrically thin and optically thick. Um, and uh, on the left hand side, though, there are, um, there are models that are, um, that are hot, where the uh, temperature of the accretion disk is closer to the virial temperature of the, of the black hole. And um, these are geometrically thick and optically thin. And in fact, um, in some parts of this range of, um, of accretion rate, they, um, um, they, they require a two temperature uh, uh, treatment to uh, consider the temperature of the electrons and ions separately because they cool at different rates. And um, in, these, uh, in these models, um, advection, actual advection of uh, energy, heat energy into the black hole is uh, one of the, is acts kind of like a cooling mechanism that competes with or even dominates at, at low accretion rates, um, the, um, the radiation rate. And, um, and so we have these advection dominated accretion flows that form a branch here. They're thermally stable. Uh, there's a thermally unstable branch down here, the um, Shapiro, Lightman, Erdley uh, models down here. And then there are additional uh, branches uh, to be considered that, um, that may connect the um, thick and thin uh, models, the luminous hot accretion flow, for example. Now, uh, for our purposes, for galaxy clusters, of course, we're talking mostly about these lower mass accretion rate systems. But there, you see that there's, um, um, you know, applying a simple switch to go from low to high accretion rate is not, um, is not really a, a complete physical picture. This um, the presence of this um, these two different um, solutions <clears throat> to the accretion disk equations um, is uh, what's behind uh, state changes or what's sought to be behind state changes. For example, in X-ray binaries, um, where you can have a high state in which um, the disk is essentially a thin disk, um, and a, um, a high soft state, and then a, a low hard state in which the um, the disk. Has a has a component which is is thick, and you can have a, a hybrid disk which um, has the center um, as an advection dominated flow, and the outside as a um, as a thin disk. So there are a lot, there's a lot more complication um, in the um, behavior of accretion disks and the type of feedback that you get from these systems than is typically envisioned in the um, uh, subgrid models. So the alternative approach to this that we are uh, developing. Um, is uh, is one in which uh, we adopt the um, uh, adopt the basic idea behind the cold mode accretion. That is that instead of using the Bondi um, Bondi formalism to uh, compute an accretion rate, we actually measure a flux through a surface. There are different ways to do that. We're using Monte Carlo integration, um, but with particle based methods, of course, you just follow particles that pass through the surface. And um, and and what what allows us to do this kind of thing is um, is that uh, computer power is now such that even in cluster simulations, uh, we can go below the kiloparsec level and start to resolve the Bondi radius. So it's a, an imp you know any subgrid model depends on whether you resolve or don't resolve some key physical scale, and in this case, that scale is the Bondi radius. So um, so we can do that with AMR um, adaptive mesh refinement. But we of course can't go all the way down to the accretion disk even with this extreme refinement. So um, so. We imagine that there's this this control surface we call it that um, that we measure the accretion of mass, momentum, and energy through, and then within that, um, there's the black hole plus accretion disk system that are modeled together way down in the length scale spectrum at the center, and then around that there is um, effectively a uh, a numerical boundary, an embedded boundary um, that is used to um, to remove mass from the the system. And the idea with this boundary is that we we hope to not affect the flow too much through the control surface, um, but to allow um, to 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 make it possible that uh, to not have uh, back pressure build up to um, to um, uh, oppose the accretion. So this resetting region, there are various ways of handling that. If we had a, um, if we had a uh, moving mesh, uh, we could certainly um, wrap that around this reset region. Um, uh, but it, uh, instead, what we do is we apply a sink particle approach, where we um, we uh, we multiply the um, gas quantities by a kernel that gradually removes uh, material within the reset region. Um, and then um, the way we impose feedback is using the uh, the traditional at, at the moment at least is using the traditional methods of 
of adding um, feedback uh, material to energy and momentum to the gas within a cylindrical or a cone-shaped region around the um, the accretor, um, and um, the 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 hope that you know what we're what we're moving toward is um, is to be able to use this one D black hole plus accretion disk model that we treat you know, the, the, the system with um, to actually predict both the form and the efficiency of the feedback instead of having it be a, a completely arbitrary parameter. And so, uh, so what that kind of looks like is um, we have a, a 1D representation of the accretion disk that splits into both a, um, an advection dominated part and a thin part. We have the accretion rate, for example, shown here for mass, the accretion rate measured on the control surface um, that uh, feeds in to the disk, we keep track of the disk mass. Um, the model of the disk keeps uh, track of um, losses through different zones in the disk. And then um, whatever's left falls under the black hole and some of that is removed in the form of jets. So, um, so given the black hole mass and given the disk mass and given the accretion rate from the outside, we can compute equilibrium models that um, you know, establish equilibrium pretty quickly, um, but very slowly change because the viscous time scale is long. Um, very slowly changed in response to um, changes in the um, outside accretion rate. And so here's an example of, an, uh, of one of these hybrid disk models without uh, wind feedback coming off of it. Now, um, one thing that's uh, characteristic of the hot models as opposed to the thin disk models is that the, um, the hot models don't just produce jets, but they also produce, um, produce winds. And those winds come out in a different pattern with different momentum than the, um, uh, than the jet does. So I'll mention that a little bit more in a moment. Um, I want to uh, note that this isn't, we're not the first to actually implement this um, in a series of papers. Deborah Shiochki's group at Cambridge has actually been building a model like this in a repo. Um, that what they're doing to handle the, um, the material passing through um, their, their uh, capture radius is to break it up into four quadrants and to keep track separately of, that, of uh, the accretion in those four quadrants. So what this illustrates, I think, is just generally that um, when, you, when you take a flux-based approach to measuring the accretion rate, you can discriminate all kinds of different ways in which matter can pass through, the, through that surface. So you can keep track separately of, multi, of cold gas, hot gas. Um, you can keep track of the, um, the, the passage of momentum, angular momentum uh, through it. <clears throat> so you gain a, a much more flexibility in um, in modeling the accretion onto the uh, the black hole plus accretion disk system, and then if you join that to a model of the accretion disk itself, um, then you can you can uh, take advantage of advances in our understanding of accretion disks to um, physically consistently predict the um, the form and the efficiency of the feedback that comes off. Um, as well as uh, ha properly handling those state changes. So, um, so this is just an example of some of the resolution tests that we're doing with, um, uh, with Flash. And, um, and again, no normally the, um, the distinction, you know, the switch that is often used splits between just um, jets for low uh, accretion rates and some kind of radiation, um, you know, thermal heating basically um, uh, when the accretion rate is high. Um, and, um, and the distinction, you know, that's, that's too simple of a distinction. We also need to consider these winds, as I've said. And that is starting to be done um, in a more realistic fashion in galaxy simulations. So here's an example from Tori et al. with Gizmo, um, where they actually putting a, a you know, a, a wider solid angle uh, subrelativistic wind in a galaxy uh, simulation. And you can see that um, uh, it's confined somewhat by the disk in this case because uh, there is a disk, um, but um, uh, but it does produce a very different kind of outflow than um, than uh, your typical jet, which um, often has to deal with the fact that um, there's this so-called dent dentist drill problem. You know, the the jet wants to uh, punch directly out through uh, whatever is surrounding it. Okay, so, uh, so just as an example of, uh, uh, so we haven't yet tied this 1D disk model to our, um, our code yet. Uh, it's, it's a separate tool right now. But, um, but just looking at, um, 
uh, the accretion model, uh, we've done some calculations where we look at the um, the ability of precession to isotropize the um, the feedback from jets and how it interacts with larger scale flows, um, turbulent flows. And um, and uh, what we find is that um, you know as you increase the velocity dispersion, the one in the middle here is uh, sort of a velocity dispersion that is typical of, uh, for example, what's from Hitomi in the Perseus cluster. Um, but if we compare no precession to uh, this weak uh, sorry, um, no precession to precession on the top and bottom and increasing turbulent velocity dispersion going from left to right, um, we see that um, uh, processing jet um, is much more affected by turbulent motions than a non-processing jet. So, um, so, you know, this is likely to be uh, this interaction between precession and the um, <clears throat> and the uh, and the surrounding flows is likely to be important in in um, governing how effective this feedback is in coupling to the surroundings. So um, so let me uh, let me just say then um, uh, repeat uh, and highlight the uh, different things that this approach enables compared to the um, the sort of traditional way of imposing uh, feedback and accretion. Um, this allows access to the full range of disk states, um, both the hot disk and the cold disk uh, solutions, and therefore it allows um, state transitions to be triggered by external flows. For example, uh, turbulence that's uh, produced by um, by galaxies or, or, or sloshing, um, as well as cold fronts and and shocks. So that be, that makes the coupling between the um, the black hole and the and the cluster scale flows much more self consistent. Um, it allows us to impose a, a physically consistent um, form and efficiency of feedback rather than just having this be a free parameter that we have to loosely constrain with cluster structure. Um, and in particular, um, the, um, uh, the, the, the amount of feedback that comes out in the form of a wind as opposed to a jet depends on the disk state, not just the accretion rate, but also whether it is a thin or a thick disk. Um, uh, this, uh, you know, even with the limitations of a specific implementation, um, this provides a framework that allows us to continuously improve the treatment of the AGN uh, based on inputs from the community that does uh, GRMHD modeling of accretion disks. And then finally, we can um, naturally uh, break apart the, um, the, the uh, accreting material into uh, cold and hot phases um, and consider uh, the angular momentum of that gas as well. Uh, to allow us to uh, separately handle those those types of accretion, and um, and that's helped somewhat by the fact that um, just computer power is improved, and we're now able to resolve the Bondi radius in a lot of simulations. But um, um, but as I said, you know, and we still need the subgrid model for the accretion disk, and so that information is a crucial input to getting the accretion correct. And and one of the things that enables, for example, is um, is tracking the black hole spin precession. One thing I forgot to mention with uh, Shiachki's group is that they um, they include the bardeen patterson effect, which um, causes the disk close to the black hole if its if its spin axis is different from the black holes, um, the the disk will actually be forced to align uh, with the spin of the black hole within a, a certain radius, and so they they include that effect as well. All right, I think uh, I've hit thirty five minutes and um, and. Uh, Right on time, I guess. The um, so let me just finish with a summary. Uh, ad adaptive, uh, sorry, uh, <laughs> uh, um, active galaxy uh, feedback in galaxy clusters is a critical process for uh, managing the for maintaining the um, the thermodynamic state of those clusters, um, but it's also unresolvable, um, and. Um, and so uh, the, the traditional subgrid implementations that um, have been developed for cosmological simulations um, have serious limitations, in part born uh, because of uh, the, um, the original um, resolutions that were achievable, um, but also because um, you know, it took some time to develop an understanding of the multi-phase nature of the, um, of the uh, feedback process. Um, these new approaches that um, that use a, um, a, a sort of a flux-based accretion a calculation together with a modeling of the black hole and the accretion disk together offer uh, a lot of advantages and um, and uh, for for both increased realism of these simulations and also for exploring um, you know the the sorts of triggering that takes a, a cluster from cold core or cool core to 
um, non cool core or, and back again. And, and this would help help to explain um, oddball systems like the, uh, the Phoenix cluster. So thanks again. All right, thank you, Paul, for a great talk. Uh, we have uh, plenty of time for questions. If you have any, just raise your hand using the um, uh, using the raise hand feature, or if you want us to read them off, you can put them in the chat window. We've already got one from uh, Magda Sivek. Uh, at what outer radius does the accretion disk stop? And is this consistent with observations, if any? Oh, that's a good question. So um, typically, the accretion disk is taken to stop around the place where it um, it becomes self gravitating. Right in these accretion disk models I've mentioned, uh, typically you only consider the um, the gravitational field of the black hole, um, and and that is uh, that is on the. Uh, let's see, let me remind myself. I was going to say milliparsec scale, but it's um, if we go back to the. Um, oops, what happened here? If we go back to um, uh, Massimo's uh, nice plot from his nature paper. Oh boy. Okay. Um, it should be, it should be about um, the, you know, the milliparsec scale a little bit, um, a little bit larger. Sorry. So uh, um, yeah, we'd be talking about um, Scales of, uh, you know, if we're resolving in these new simulations, the parsec scale, we're talking about maybe one one hundredth to um, uh, one one thousandth of that scale. Now, it's possible that you get uh, features like in um, in the gizmo simulation where you see spiral arms and things like that um, surrounding it. And um, and for that, you know, being able to resolve those scales below a parsec would help. Um, but um, uh, it's it's not going to extend beyond the parsec scale. Any other questions? We've got one from Anna Rosen. Hi, uh, nice talk. Um, I just have a question. Like, uh, I'm not as familiar with the creation onto black holes. Uh, does the same picture apply to like stellar uh, stellar mass black holes? Um, or is this only to supermassive? Like, does it does it cover like the cold versus hot accretion versus? Because it does it just depend on if it's Eddington versus super Eddington or sub Eddington versus super Eddington across the mass range, or is this just special to supermassive black holes? In principle, it should not be special to supermassive black holes. Um, uh, they, you know, as I said, the X-ray binaries exhibit these state transitions yeah. as well. Um, I think what's uh, maybe the key difference here is the the type of accretion, you know, the the environment from which they accrete. So, for example, in an X-ray binary, you're accreting. Well, you might be accreting from a, a wind, but you'd also be accreting mostly from a Roche lobe overflow. So yeah. um, there'd be um, a highly directional and uh, maybe less multi-phase character of the surrounding gas. Um, yeah, but uh, but you know, if you just had a a uh, lone black hole wandering through a molecular cloud, say, for something like that, then then it, this might be a more, you know, applicable model. But this this whole subgrid framework, I think, would be directly transferable into calculations of interacting binary stars. And so that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons I'm interested in it. Um, and in particular, um, one of the things that I work on is uh, common envelope evolution. And, um, you know, one interesting question is, does, does accretion energy help in envelope ejection in that problem. And mm -hmm. if it does, the accretion is occurring in a, it's a hyper accretion mode. So yeah. very high, very super Eddington. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's gonna be a very different kind of feedback and very different kind of model for the disk, but um, this is the framework that would enable you to include that. So so this, so your subgrid model could be applied in any context as long as you can differentiate if it's super Eddington versus sub Eddington accretion. Yeah, and keep track of the dish accretion disk properties, the surface surface mass density in particular. Yeah. What if you don't resolve that though? Like I'm thinking of something like if you have something, I'm not as familiar with X-ray binaries either, so I don't know what the size of the accretion disk is, but let's say you have something in terms of tens of AU resolution. Like I'm thinking more of like if you form, let's say you form um, black holes from supernovae and star clusters before gas is fully expelled. 
Mm-hmm. Um, maybe you could have feed, uh, sorry, accretion from the surrounding molecular gas, or even if you had a failed supernovae, so yeah. you just generate a black hole, so you don't even disrupt the cloud. Um, so yeah, but but still you'd be limited by resolution. Yeah. But I think the, the key thing here is that you resolve the Bondi radius. So that the you, Bondi radius. Okay. Uh, yeah. So that you could reasonably say that material that passes through the control surface, if you know that its angular momentum is low enough, that it will accrete. Okay. Great. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Any other questions? Uh, we have another one from Magda. Uh, yeah, I, I have a follow-up question on uh, the AGN disk. So when you say that the maximum of the radius is around um, a hundredth of a parsec, mm-hmm. what does that mean about um, accretion disks around binaries? Because in terms of a supermassive black hole binary, the, um, the disk is often invoked as an argument to um, merging the binary below a parsec. Mm-hmm. So then, so I've been wondering about this for a while. Can you actually form an accretion disk around a supermassive black hole binary um, at larger scales than the disk would form around a single black hole? Or... I think so, yeah. Um, although, again, it's uh, typically the truncation radius that people consider is often you know, where the disk itself becomes self-gravitating. Um, so, so if you had two black holes you know, of the same mass, compared to one black hole, the, the single black hole by itself, then presumably that radius would be um, would be closer in, right? Because there'd be more mass in the black holes. Um, but sorry, no, be farther out, be farther out. Yeah, that's right. So it would be larger, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then, um, and of course the, you know, if there's a circumbinary disk as opposed to just the disk around one of the black holes, then, um, you know, then it's going to have to be larger to um, to be able to treat the binary as a point mass, right? And then streams of material coming off the inside of that, flowing onto accretion disks around the individual black holes. So, so yeah, the circumbinary disk would probably be larger. But you can't make the same. You can't make the exact same argument for the truncation radius um, because the physics is different, right? So, uh, well, if you're just comparing the um, the self gravity of the disk to the black holes, then you have to be farther away from the black holes in order for the disk's mass to, to matter more. Okay, thanks. Yeah. We've still got time, don't be shy. If not, let's thank Paul for a great talk and uh, hope to see you all again next time. Thank you, bye-bye.